Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Thank you very much for coming along to this session this afternoon. Um, my name is Matt Jordan. I'm a sheep and beef farmer from Northumberland and also work for Regenerate Outcomes. And we're hosting this session today on the, the role of agroforestry in regenerative ag. So we're very uh, fortunate to be joined by Kyle Richardville from Understanding Ag, who's going to unpack how agroforestry can help us achieve um, the principles of uh, soil regeneration. And then uh, George Young, um, regenerative farmer from Essex, is going to talk through some of his agroforestry systems. And then I'll say a few words at the end about how um, agroforestry can fit within um, a wider regenerative system to earn uh, additional sources of, 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 of revenue. And then um, we'll just go straight through the presentations and then take questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to Kyle to start us off. Great. Thanks for coming, everybody. This has been a lovely couple of days. It's been uh, great to learn about agroforestry. Oh, did it? Okay. Uh, so my name is Kyle Richard. Like you said, I work for Understanding Ag. It's a North American education and consulting company. We have farmers and ranchers from the Chihuahuan Desert in Mexico up to the northern plains of Canada uh, to vineyards and orchards of California to the forested area of the Northeast. So uh, we have actual operators doing these things and we, we educate out of what we call the 634 framework. Um, it's, it's, okay, sorry. Um, it's not the 10 commandments, They're, they aren't thou shalts and thou shalt nots. They are scientific principles and observations um, that we have actually observed um, in our operations. So. Um, I've talked to a few people this week, uh, these past couple of days, and, and one common thing I've been, theme I've been hearing is we need to have a good definition of regenerative agriculture. And um, this is our attempt at it. It's not perfect, but it goes like this. Farming and ranching in synchrony with nature to repair, rebuild, revitalize, and restore ecosystem function, starting with life in the soil and moving to all life above the soil. And I really like this definition because it's outcomes-based rather than practice-based. You know, some people say, I, I min till or I don't use glyphosate, so I'm regenerative. Maybe, maybe not. I think the outcome uh, speaks for itself here. So here are the six principles of soil health. The first, which we say is the most important, is understanding your context. I start with the inside of the person, so understanding your, your spiritual beliefs, your philosophical beliefs, um, your, your personality, your risk tolerance is all very, very important when designing a regenerative plan. Moving outward to your relationships, how, what's your relationship like with your landlord? Would they allow trees to be planted on your operation? Um, your family, do, does your mother or father run, run the show and they're not on board? Or do you have children that are interested? Those are all important. And lastly, your ecological, uh, historical context of the land. Where I grew up and here, the, the climax uh, successionary um, biome, I guess, is forest. So in introducing agroforestry into this area makes a lot of sense in, in terms of this context. So. And the second, um, I said it's thou shalt, it's not thou shalt nots, but um, it really what we mean is minimize mechanical and chemical disturbance of the soil. Um, natural systems disturb the soil with earthworms and insects. So the more we can leave them to do that, the healthier our soils will be. And, and trees certainly do that and perennial crops. Um, certainly do do that. And in terms of synthetic fertilizers, we want to back off on those and make our microbes work for us again. Third is cover and build armor sur surface armor. So there's an American soil scientist named Ray Archuleta, and he says, bare soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. And that is absolutely true, especially on a day like today when it's hot and windy and the topsoil can dry off and blow away in the wind or be compacted with, um, with the next rainfall. So agroforestry does an extremely good job of covering and armoring the soil. Fourth is the principle of diversity. Healthy ecosystems have checks and balances in those ecosystems, whether it be plants, we want to include grasses, legumes, forbs, and woodies, such as in agroforestry. Uh, but we also think about microbes, bacteria, fungi, 
Having diverse populations of those are our best defenses against bacterial and fung pathogens. And in terms of insects, on average, one in 1,700 insect species are pathogens. The other 1,699 are neutral or beneficial and consume that one path pathogen. So the more we can make them proliferate, the healthier landscapes we will have and the less disturbance we will have to put onto our land. Fifth is keeping living roots in the soil as many days uh, as possible. Again, trees, big honking perennial trees, going to be there forever, do a really good job of this. Um, but living roots are extremely important for, for many reasons, but I'll just touch on a couple. The first is we all know the statistic, or at least I've heard, soil microbe, there's more living microbes in a healthy teaspoon of soil than humans on Earth. But what I think is almost more important is from the subsoil to the topsoil, living active microbes only occupy less than 1% of the surface area. So we need what, to create what I call soil BNB. And living roots are one place. They're exuding sugars and high energy foods for these microbes to prolifer proliferate and uh, be active. And second is uh, organic matter in the various stages of decomposition. And living roots provide two thirds of organic matter inputs into um, say a cover crop, into the soil than, than the shoots. So living roots are extremely important both when they're alive and when they're decaying. And lastly is integrating animals as much as possible onto the landscape. Every terrestrial landscape, as far as I'm aware, developed the, our healthy soils through animal integration. So um, one common example I've heard in agroforestry or a food forest is introducing pigs that will um, consume fruits that are rotting and have dropped onto the floor or nuts and they clean up and, and they can build healthy soil in that way. So um, full disclosure, I grew up in the Midwest of the United States on a corn and soy operation. So agroforestry, I'm learning a, a whole lot. So, um, but that the, the pork example is one that I've, I've seen and I've read about. So. so moving on to the three rules of adaptive stewardship. The first is compounding. So in nature and our management practices, everything that's done is connected. Everything has a compounding and cascading effect. And oftentimes, it's largely negative or positive. So with our management practices, we want to make sure that we're creating positive compounding and cascading effects rather than negative, such as in a deforestation uh, situation. The second is the rule of disruption. So as I said, nature is complex, and it has the ability to restore, revitalize, and rebuild itself, just like our human bodies. So when we work out, we actually create mic micro tears in our muscles, but we grow back even stronger. And the same is true of our soils and our land. So a common example is altering stock density for grazers out there. Pull them in tight for a short amount of time and leave them off that land for longer periods of time. That soil will really respond uh, positively to that disruption. And the last is the rule of diversity. So diversity is extremely important. It shows up in the six, the three, and the four, so I won't explain it uh, each time. And lastly are the four ecosystem processes. So as farmers and ranchers, we're in the job of harvesting sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and turning it into something marketable. So Albert Einstein, uh, in his equation E equals MC squared, we know that energy equals matter. So our job is to create as much material that we can sell from the energy of the sun, and that's done by collecting that sunlight, putting it into bio, uh, carbon bonds into the soil and creating more matter and more energy for our system to chug along. Second is the water cycle. You know, there's a reason why scientists find they look for water on other planets, because it's an indication of life. We can have the best design plan. We can have all the best intentions. But without water, life comes to a screeching halt. And so forgive me, I haven't memorized it. But here's a quote. And this we've known this for over 500 years. This is a quote from Ferdinand Columbus, Christopher Columbus's son, in 1494. He said, Columbus departed from Jamaica. Every afternoon, there was a rain squall that lasted about an hour. The admiral attributes this to the great forests of the land. He knew from experience that formerly this also occurred in the Canary, Madeira, and Azor Islands. 
But since the removal of forests that once covered these islands, they do not have so much mist and rain as before. So trees play an incredibly important role in the water cycle through their capturing of the rain in the first place and evapotranspiring back to the air where it can condense and complete that water cycle. So kudos to all of you for including more trees uh, onto your landscape. Third is the mineral cycle. Sim simplistically, I say this is the big guy eating the little guy. So in that soil B and B rhizosphere around the root, we have protozoa, nematodes, and such consuming the bags of fertilizer that are bacteria and fungi, and their micro manure is absorbed by the roots of the plant. And that's how the great forests of the Amazon and the Great Plains grew so much diversity and so much biomass without a single um, drop of anhydrous uh, ammonia or nitrogen fertilizer, potash, all of that. So the more we can get those systems going on our operation, the less money that we have to pay. And fourth, again, is the rule of diversity, extremely important in the six, the three, and the four. So for all of us, myself included, whenever we uh, look to make a management uh, change or continue doing what we have been doing, the big question that I want us all to think about is, how does my management affect the four ecosystem processes? Because the more out of whack they are, the more energy and time and money I have to put into it to overcome those inefficiencies. In a nutshell, we want to work with nature rather than against. We want to be this good boy on the right using gravity rather than Sisyphus on the left trying to roll that boulder up the hill. I'll finish by showing three books uh, that I've read recently that have had a big impact on me, um, if they show up. Yep. So the first is Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard. He's an American permaculturist. Uh, he has a food forest in Wisconsin, has great information. The second, I believe, is also by him for water design. I think they use the key line permaculture uh, system. Uh, has a lot of good information. And the third is The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wollobin, which is absolutely fantastic for anybody wanting more general information on how trees communicate, defend themselves, uh, things of that nature. So, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're all enjoying what I'm thinking is an absolutely fantastic show. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about my agroforestry system um, and just a little bit about what I'm kind of doing on the farm and how it all ties together. So, uh, this is me looking silly in the same hat. Um, I've been farming for 10 years now, just over. Um, it's a, a family farm that I, I came back to. Um, and I'll be perfectly honest, when I came home, I used to work in London. Um, I basically got fed up with being in the city, and I never believed I would uh, enjoy farming um, or didn't think it was in my bones or anything like that, but thought it was going to be a better life than I was leading in London. So I came back home, uh, and lo and behold, I absolutely love farming, or kind of a bit more specifically, I absolutely love the ability of being able to kind of um, really embrace nature on the farm, and I've realised that that is absolutely my obsession and kind of what drives me in in everything I do on the farm. So a little bit about the history of the farm. Um, so roll back 10 years ago, or e even actually roll back four years ago, we were 100% arable on the farm. Um, and we were growing wheat, rape, and peas. Nothing very magnificent. Um, there wasn't really any management particularly focused towards ecology or anything like that. Uh, we had gone down the, the no-till route, um, so we were using glyphosate and not ploughing to, uh, to establish our crops. Um, and I kind of felt that wasn't really doing as much as I wanted. Um, in terms of the farm itself, we're kind of, we have been a very denuded farm, so a lot of hedges were ripped out, a lot of fields were rolled into larger fields, so kind of you know, average field size of sort of you know, 20 hectares, something like that, so big fields which obviously, as we know, is not particularly great for nature or for anything really working very well for you. Um, so and, and, uh, uh, one little nice thing, we've, we've made quite a lot of changes recently. Uh, some of this was brought about because uh, I lost a permanent employee a year ago, so it's just me working on the farm, so you've got to make some changes. And back in March, uh, I waved goodbye to that combine and uh, most of the other machinery on the farm and it felt absolutely fantastic. Because um, it's bloody expensive to keep all this stuff up. Uh, this stuff up. Anyway, so 
a lot of the changes as I mentioned started in 2020. Everything happened at the same time. This is not something I recommend doing because it takes a lot of brain space to make the changes, but it does mean that changes happen really quickly. Um, and it's kind of one of those things that, uh, just to mention about the speed of change, especially when you're talking about nature recovery, it is one of the most kind of rewarding things to do on your farm because it happens so quickly. And obviously it builds over time, but your initial things to do to get nature back on your farm, it's astounding how quickly those changes happen. Um, so I started off with um, herbal lays. I have now converted to 100% organic on the farm. Um, so yeah, these herbal lays, obviously this great initial idea to kind of build diversity, be growing more diverse, plants on the farm, bringing more types of seeds, more types of flowers, all those sorts of things, all the other stuff. But obviously when you have that, you've then got to have something to manage it. So I went into um, red pole cows, uh, started off with 11 in calf um, and have been, been growing my herd. And the funny thing now is, and I, I still find it funny, if ever I'm quoted, it always says arable farmer George Young. Uh, well, uh, they need to start changing that because I'm now a livestock farmer. Um, and I'm sure arable will feature in my future at some point, but I've transpired I love the cows. I actually read an article, um, or it's a, a blog post that I'd written back in sort of 2019, something like that, and I specifically said that I did not want to have cattle, or I did not want to personally manage the cattle, and here I am absolutely <laughs> loving it. Anyway, things change. Um, now the big project, oh, there you go, some uh, short horns, which I also run now. It's a big project I'm working on currently, and it's all about connectivity on my farm. So this is something called a wild seam. Um, I've actually got funding from this for a new road project that's happening nearby, something called the Lower Thames Crossing. So 100% grant funded. Um, it's, a, it's an infrastructure project, so it sounds very glamorous. I mean, um, if you look on this picture here on the right-hand side, it's sort of the idea is, is carving, you know, a, a, it's about 50 acres through the middle of my farm to interlink all the fields together. That's the rough idea of it. It'll look very unglamorous when it's done because it's a lot of hedges. Uh, a lot of hedge, hedges being planted. They always look crap at the beginning, don't they? Uh, a lot of uh, fences going in and a lot of culverts. So nothing very glamorous, but it will look amazing. So obviously within all these thought processes, uh, all these thought processes, agroforestry is an absolutely natural fit. Um, and I love it. I absolutely love it. So I'll, I'll kind of whistle through what I did with my system and then go on to the bits that I kind of like about it. So um, mine are 36 meter um, alleys, straight alleys, and six meter belts of trees. And I've done predominantly double rows of trees planted. Uh, this was about trying to make sure that, um, I've seen certain agroforestry systems where people go up and they very carefully mow around every single tree. Um, I'm not really that style of farmer anyway, but it's much harder to do if you plant two rows of trees. So you end up with a really nice kind of area in the middle for, for wildlife to run about. Now, obviously, when you think about a scheme like this and you think about my wild seam, what I'm doing is channeling the ability for nature to basically get everywhere on my farm without being disturbed or anything like that, having that, that level of, of permanent protection. And I planted tons of stuff. Would not recommend this. Uh, this is about 7,000 trees um, in, in one, one uh, season of planting. Um, but lots and lots of types of uh, nuts, lots of types of fruits, all sorts of stuff, and a load of timber as well. So this field, like I say, back from rolling fields together, this was originally four fields, and this is what it looked like before we planted it. So 20 hectares, straightforward arable field. Um, we planted with an auger. So if you plant with an auger, it's one of those things you've got to be careful to bash up the size of the hole to make sure the roots have got somewhere to escape. So if you do do planting like that. Um, one thing to remind people of, if anyone else has got services running through your farm, don't forget them. I'm normally very good if it's, if it's digging a ditch or anything like that, make sure I ring them. If it's laying a pipe, make sure I ring them. Uh, when in the middle of my, or actually the day before we were actually due to start properly laying out, I realised I'd placed one of, the, one of my tree belts slap bang on top of the oil pipeline in exactly the same angle. Uh, so I have one belt which is 42 metres wide um, and I had to change which trees went in there because they, they only allow certain trees that aren't going to bugger about with their roots, basically. Um, if you want a really good way of giving yourself the willies when you do a tree planting project, get a curtain cider, turn up with 1,200 trees on it that look that big. Because um, you really realise that you've gone into quite a large endeavour. Um, however, it leads to some happy times. There's my mother and father and me looking like a wally again next to some quince trees. Um, and in terms of organising that number of trees, it's quite challenging. And I recommend if anyone does do this, 
get a couple hundred trees a week. It's a really enjoyable process like that. Do not get them all at once. Um, we planted in December 2020, one of the most challenging times to plant. Uh, you've got to break, omelets, uh, break eggs to make omelets, right? So that's what we did there. Um, it was horrendously wet. Uh, so our water table was literally at the top of our soil. Um, so every time we dug a hole with the auger, literally within a minute, it filled with water and we had to bail out these holes before we planted the trees. Not an enjoyable process. Um, so anyway, uh, and yeah, it was, it, it was actually, it was dry at least. It wasn't raining when we did the December planting, but in February, it pissed it down all day, which is marvelous. Um, so yeah, and actually these ruts uh, left by the ATV, so just a little quad bike that we were using transport trees about, left ruts sort of six inches deep, and I'm still rolling my ankle on them today. Um, so now I've got a few bits I just wanted to quickly talk about, because we also had drought a year after So we had that horrible wet year that we planted in, and then of course harvest 2021, or summer 2021, was absurdly dry and hot. Uh, this is the first year that my trees ever had a chance to actually properly grow, which is nice. They've had a very nice year this year, and they've put on growth literally like that, a load of the trees. It's pretty remarkable. Um, wood chip, I mean, I don't know if any of you guys went on Helen's walk yesterday when she was talking a lot about wood chip, is fantastic. It's where I am, it's expensive, which is annoying, um, but it's really fantastic. Uh, don't use those little uh, compostable weed suppressant mats. Top tip. Uh, they're expensive, time consuming to install, and last for six months. Um, and fencing, I mean, actually, as it happens, Helen's example is exactly the same as mine. Definitely fence your tree belts when you're going to graze them and stuff. But, um, uh, and then the final one is, of all the pests, so we're very lucky. We don't have deer and we don't have rabbits. Um, so we have some hares. But it's badgers are the ones that are the hardest thing to manage. They just dig up all your trees. So if anyone's got any tips on how to manage badgers, that would be fantastic. Uh, they're my nephews. Um, and then, of course, the prettiest thing is actually having, um, having the cows in the field with the trees. Now, I mean, this was actually, that was uh, summer 21, so they were just on leaf. They'd not been in very long, and it obviously looks magnificent with, with cows in the background. Um, this, again, would have been that same summer. And the really cool thing is that finally, two and a half years or two years after that, that picture there, we actually have belts that look like proper lots of trees. You can stand at the bottom of the field, you can see them. They're on Google Earth. That's always a good metric now, isn't it, when stuff shows up on Google Earth? Um, but yeah, so it's, it's been amazing. And uh, the thing I find most incredible about the agroforestry... Now, I'm sorry, I'm really like, crap at having proper data for all my things. So it's, it's farmer data. I'm sure you're all aware what farmer data looks like. Uh, good old anecdotal stuff. Um, we've got three fields next to each other with the agroforestry in the middle. They've all been managed exactly the same, all in herbal lays at the moment, yada, yada. All managed exactly the same, save for the trees. And using the metric of how bananas the dogs go when you take them into a field, I've got a 10-year-old lab who's quite lame, and he will disappear in the agroforestry, and I won't see him for an hour, versus any other ones he just trots by my heel. The biodiversity has gone absolutely nuts in this field. And, and for me, with me, as, as I was saying, my main driver being bringing nature onto the farm, I cannot believe in two and a half years the level of nature restoration that this has provided. And I worked out, I mean, I've got a bit of a funky scheme here, and I've got wider belts than most people would do. Uh, I worked out it's about one and a half hectares out of 20 that's been taken out. And if you kind of halve the width of your tree belts, it's you know, half that amount of land that's been taken out. It's not actually a huge amount. Um, you do get pests. Now, of course, we're organic, or in conversion. This field is organic now. Uh, so my damsons, these were, they were very pretty um, caterpillars, I don't know how well you can see them, very pretty fluffy caterpillars on there that completely decimated my damsons uh, last year. And I was like, well, they've all died, haven't they? And the coolest thing is, I went back this year, now of course, if you're worrying about making sure you get a really good fruit harvest, you probably don't want these things to happen, and you probably are going to try and tackle those pests. But I look at this as like, when you're beginning to regenerate ecosystems, you will get kind of spikes in certain creatures, and that will obviously bring in more predators for those things. So I looked at it, and I was like, well, it looks like I've lost my dams and trees. We'll deal with it in the future. As it happens, those dams and trees this year are phenomenal. They've, again, put in a vast amount of growth. They're looking healthy as. There's no leaf stripping whatsoever. So those caterpillars have just been part of another ecosystem growing on the farm. Um, and then there are lots of nice things. So obviously at the moment, um, it's, it's nice hearing from Helen. So Helen's system is four years older than mine. Um, and it's nice hearing that she also hasn't necessarily had best years with fruit, because I've been a bit worrying that maybe I'd done something wrong. 
But uh, last year, my mother did make some very nice jams. Uh, nothing, nothing better than having a, a, a good jam-making mother. mother. Um, and uh, my wife is also into that sort of thing. So if there's ever a way to make her happy, uh, it's taking her out on a nice summer's day uh, with the dogs and uh, a nice basket and um, going and picking fruit. And hopefully one day we should be going with, obviously, things behind quad bikes, not a little basket like that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to finish here. Um, I hope you guys have got some good questions later on. Um, but I would genuinely say that agroforestry has been the biggest change on my entire farm for only positive reasons. And I can't wait to do my next project. It will look very different, and I think that's a lot of the fun. Um, but until you do a project and do it at enough of a scale to realize what works and doesn't for your ideas, um, you won't know what to do in the future. So just do it. It'd be my thing. Anyway, thank you very much. Brilliant. Well, how to follow that? Um, <laughs> I'll keep this short before I melt. But we've had a really good um, kind of the, the idea is, is that you kind of understand the role that agroforestry can, can play within a regenerative system. We've had a really great example of how that's really brought George's farm to life. And then I'm going to talk now about how one of the classes of benefits, suites of benefits we get from agroforestry, which is the environmental benefits, can earn you as farmers um, some extra money. I mean, what the agroforestry shows, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but broadly, right, we can think about these three groups of benefits from agroforestry. You know, you've got the direct benefits on farm productivity, that's your shelter, your shade, your perhaps reduced crop pests or whatever. There's the opportunity to diversify your enterprises, but then there's these environmental benefits that we can get from our trees as well. So whether that's reducing flood hazard by slowing water down on the farm, improving water quality by getting nutrients out of the groundwater, improvements in air quality, reducing soil erosion, but obviously the, the obvious one and the one that's getting a lot of attention at the moment is, is carbon. So just to talk a little bit about carbon in agroforestry trees, well, the first thing to, to bear in mind, and I know it's kind of stating the obvious, but you know, when you think about a tree, you think about all the stuff above ground. But there's also a lot of carbon in those roots as well. And so when we think about measuring the amount of carbon in a tree, you've got, you know, you've got all the stuff above ground, think about the roots as well. There's a really interesting um, studies from the UK that are, are showing that essentially per tree, you get more carbon from planting a tree in a silver pastoral system than you would from planting it in a woodland context. And the reasons for this is that when you plant a tree in, in silver pasture, you've got that understory that's still kind of um, there. So you've got a permanent pasture with a high amount of carbon in it maintained by that kind of permanent sward. And what you're essentially doing is adding some woody biomass to that, to that setting. So you get all the carbon of the permanent pasture plus your tree, whereas in a woodland setting, you often lose that understory after a few years, right? And so you don't have the level of carbon inputs coming from the pasture there. The other thing, of course, to remember is that a, a tree in a, a kind of a widely spaced planting has a much more open growth form. So more branches, more carbon there, rather than perhaps a, a kind of a more single stem approach in a, in a forestry planting. And this is quite cool, right? Because we hear a lot as farmers about kind of replacing uh, farming with trees. But there's just some really nice kind of points there of how integrating trees into our farms can actually deliver potentially more carbon for the same number of trees as that kind of woodland-based approach. And the other thing to say as well is that, yes, you get carbon in the trees, you get carbon in the soils below the trees, but they also create a kind of a carbon shadow in the fields around them. So hedges are particularly good for this, right, where you've got the, the kind of action of the roots, but then you've also got litter blowing from that hedge into the field. And so actually when you, when you go into a field um, adjacent to a hedgerow or another kind of maybe shelter belt or whatever it might be, you're, you can detect higher um, soil carbon levels into that field um, from the kind of litter blowing out from that hedge. So to talk about measuring carbon, why, why would we want to measure the carbon on our farms? Well, the first thing is to kind of understand what we've got, what, what our baseline is. Um, and and the, the main reason you want to do that is so you can understand the, the value of your actions, knowing the benefits we're delivering as farmers on, on the land. And then, you know, you potentially get some credits from that, some carbon credits from measuring your increases. And you've got a bunch of options of what to do with those. So you could have those credits to sell with your produce. You know, perhaps you've got a, an egg contract and they, your buyer wants carbon neutral eggs. You sell your credits up the supply chain. Um, you might want to make your own net zero claims. So, you know, quantify all your other farm emissions and then get yourself to net zero. But then it's also possible to sell some of those credits to reputable buyers who themselves are taking climate change seriously, got a credible emissions reduction plan in place, and then that is essentially a mechanism for you as a farmer to get rewarded for doing good stuff. And this is fundamentally why, despite you know, 
people having reservations, I think the carbon markets are a good thing for farmers because it's a mechanism for us as farmers to get paid for delivering environmental goods, for doing good stuff. And for me, that, that's only a good thing where we can kind of be rewarded and recognised for the good work that we're doing. So to talk a little bit about measuring carbon, so the first thing is to kind of estimate the amount of carbon in your tree. So the two classic measurements are measure the width of the tree, diameter at breast height, and then measure the height of the tree. And there's these little gadgets called clinometers where you stand and look at the tree and the angle tells you the height. And then there's various equations, allometric equations you can use to convert the, the diameter and the height into the amount of carbon. And for those of you who are at the carbon finance um, session uh, this morning, there's been some really interesting work done um, in kind of exploring an agroforestry carbon code because at the moment the allometric equations we've got are coming from kind of commercial forestry where you get these quite uniform stems which underestimates the amount of carbon you actually get in an infield tree that has a much more kind of open growth form. And so there's been some pilot work done by um, the kind of agroforestry code guys to better estimate the amount of carbon you get in infield trees. And then there's also ways to perhaps measure that directly through using LIDAR or drones and things. So it's one to watch, but at the moment, you know, this is the kind of best thing we've got available, but there will be better ways of measuring this going forward, which is quite exciting. And then the other thing to kind of remember is the soil. So going in and taking soil cores to measure the increases in, in the soil. We use agrocarbon um, at Regenerate, and they take cores 0 to 30 centimetres, and then down 30 to 60 centimetres. And that gives you a really nice baseline and then a, a place from which to me measure, measure change. So, you know, potentially we're doing this. We've, we've baselined our soil, we've planted our trees, we've gone in, measured the trees as they've grown, taken another measurement of the soil. We know how much carbon we've created, how to turn that into credits. Well, I think... To start with, it's just worth recapping what a carbon credit is, because it's, it's, it's jargon, it's quite confusing. A carbon credit is simply a tonne of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere, or a tonne of carbon dioxide emissions avoided. And so there's these kind of two forms of carbon credits, either removing carbon from the atmosphere or not emitting it. So things like um, woodland creation, planting trees, increasing soil carbon is removing carbon from the atmosphere, whereas something like peatland restoration or cutting fossil fuel use on your farm would be avoiding emissions. So when we talk about carbon sequestration, that's that, that's that process of removing carbon from the atmosphere. So you're your baseline is what you've got at present, that's your stock of carbon, and then sequestration is the change from that stock, and you generate carbon credits from that change. So some people have really high stocks, some people have really low stocks, it's not your stock that generates credits, it's the, it's the change from that stock. And finally, again, some people find this controversial, but you don't need to be net zero at the moment to be able to sell carbon credits. So some people would choose to do that. They'll say, well, hang on a minute, I'm going to get my business to, to, to net zero emissions and then sell any surplus. That's great. But at the moment, there's no requirement for us as farmers to have to fully offset all our emissions before we can sell any credits. And the reason for this is broadly because you know, there's an existing sources of farm emissions, whether that's diesel use and tractors or whatever it might be. And in every other industry that has emissions, they're required to reduce those emissions and bring them down eventually. And, and there's kind of, you know, a, at the minute, still like kind of a 30-year trajectory for that. But then the, there's the kind of second part of what we can do as farmers, which is remove carbon from the atmosphere through our soils, through trees. And essentially, the kind of view at the moment, and this is the reason the government hasn't kind of regulated in this space, is, is that it would be quite unfair to stop farmers from benefiting from increasing their carbon stocks in a way that other industries aren't, aren't held to. So, you know, no other industry is kind of expected to use its sequestration to offset its emissions. Its, its emissions are expected to decrease, and then there's this kind of separate emissions removal market. Apologies if that wasn't super clear, but it's just kind of worth bearing in mind. So just kind of to talk about the, the differences within the carbon market. So the first thing is that there's... there's actually two carbon markets. There's one sponsored by government, which is called a compliance market, and that's for power generators, and that's a very separate thing. And then there's the voluntary carbon market. And this is companies that are taking climate change seriously, have a credible net zero reduction plan in place, and want to use credits to kind of get to that net bit of net zero. Unfortunately, there are also people out there who kind of see the voluntary carbon market as a way to buy some cheap credits and continue polluting business as usual. And so it's a essentially a mechanism for, the, for them to de delay action on climate change rather than them taking climate change seriously. Now, the, 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 the constellation here is that if you're generating soil carbon credits from doing regenerative agriculture or planting agroforestry or whatever it is in the UK, they're, they're, quite, they're quite expensive credits, they're quite high-quality credits. And so they tend not to attract these kind of sort of um, 
greenwashing actors who just want to buy some cheap credits and carry on as business as usual because they're a, they're a quality product. And so you, you tend to find that people who are after these sorts of credits are actually trying to do the right thing, want to support UK farmers, want to support continued food production, and kind of have a, a better attitude about it. As I've already talked about, you can have carbon credits from removing carbon from the atmosphere or avoiding emissions. And then the last thing, and the important thing, is around verification. So at the moment, you know, you could go to your farm, you could take some soil samples, you could kind of measure an increase in soil, and you can make a claim about how much carbon you've sequestered and go and find a buyer and say, you know, I've sequestered this much carbon, would you like to buy the credits? But then there's also kind of layers of verification upon that. So yeah, that's the kind of self-verified approach. You might kind of, you know, follow some methods and say, well, this is how much carbon I think I've got, would you like to buy it? But then there's also ways to give buyers more confidence in what, you've actually, what you're claiming has actually occurred. So for blocks of woodland, um, over 400 stems a hectare. There's obviously the, the woodland carbon code. But then for agroforestry plantings that tend not to kind of fall within that, there's other options. So there's an international standard, the Verified Carbon Standard, that we work with at Regenerate, where you can um, monitor soil carbon across the farm and then layer in increases in woody biomass as well, um, so agroforestry can fall within that. Um, and what this is essentially doing is bringing in independent auditors to kind of verify that all the, the claims that are being made have actually occurred. So you've taken the soil samples correctly, you've measured the trees correctly, the trees are actually still there and alive, you've done all the sums correctly, and that what, what, what you're selling is genuinely represents carbon removed. And that gives buyers a lot more confidence in what's being claimed, and then that commands kind of a market premium as a result. So just to finish, I mean, so Regenerate Outcomes, we, we work with Understanding Ag to, to provide mentoring to farms to help you move kind of along that 634 regenerating your land. We also kind of come behind that, monitoring the environmental benefits you're delivering to help you earn additional money. Um, so mainly focusing on soil carbon across the farm, but then also can integrate agroforestry within that. Um, and with that, I'll pause and we can have a chance for questions to um, the three of us. So thank you very much. So um, we've got some uh, roving microphones as well. So if you, if you could wait for the microphone before you ask your question, and then if you could just give your, your name and kind of uh, background or whatever briefly uh, before you ask your question, that would be great. So I think there's a question down at the front here. If you could just wait for the microphone, thanks. Hello. Hi there, my name is Mark. I've got about 250 acres of sticker spruce. Um, we found it really difficult to claim carbon credits or get the land registered for carbon credits. Is there any future possibilities that that land could be used for carbon credits? So generally carbon credits are from kind of ch changes in action. So where you've got an existing woodland that's already there, it's probably quite hard to kind of get carbon credits on that, whereas if it's new planting, that would be much easier. And the reason for that is there's this uh, test called additionality. And the basis of this is that you know, carbon credits, the money for carbon credits should enable projects to happen. Um, the, the carbon credit should represent carbon that's being removed from the atmosphere because there's a value attached to it, rather than carbon that was going to be removed from the atmosphere anyway. And so, unfortunately, where trees are already in the ground, you know, they're going to sequester their carbon. They're going to keep on doing that thing. And, and they were planted without the kind of income potential from the carbon credits, so the view would be taken that they didn't need the carbon credit revenue to be able to do that. So that could be why... Um, that's that's potentially an issue. Um, a question at the back there? No. Oh. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'd just be uh, uh, getting Johns and Family Connect Wales. Um, just be wary uh, with regards to um, or recommend or advocate that farmers have a, a carbon audit before they do anything else, just to assess their uh, concern and reducing emissions, but. Uh, find out what actually where they are, what the status is with carbon. So, you know, being very careful not to sell any carbon orders before you know where exactly where you are. I understand the process of reducing emissions, etc. Um, another thing is with veri verification and the carbon, as I understand it, the carbon, the rules on additionality uh, have changed recently. So it's made it more unviable for the smaller, um, small units. Uh, of planting, but also, um, and the cost of verification is quite high um, in that respect. And anything under five hectares, I think, uh, is questionable. Um, I don't know how that sits with agroforestry. Um, 
I don't know if you can um, relay any information with regards to that. Yeah, so that, that's certainly, I've uh, kind of, you know, heard similar things about the, the Woodland Carbon Code, that if, you know, you've got to kind of think about the costs of achieving the verification against the kind of value of the credits you might generate from that. And verification is largely a fixed cost. You're paying someone to kind of, you know, come and visit the site and survey the site and kind of check that those trees are still there and they're doing okay. And so there does get to a point where, you know, if you're paying an amount, say, every five or ten years for someone to come and do that, actually the value of the carbon being generated doesn't cover that cost. There's a couple of kind of benefits, though, of working with with group projects. So there's potential to kind of, if you've got a few small, um, smaller projects together, they can be grouped together. So that's something that Regen Regenerate would look to do, for example, is to group together smaller projects. And that kind of brings down the ver verification cost per project to then make that viable. Um, with the, one of the good things about do, uh, verifying agroforestry carbon through a, a soil carbon, uh, through a, um, uh, what's the word, um, a methodology that also does soil carbon is you're bringing the verifiers to that farm anyway to look at the soil carbon so that agroforestry can be added on quite, quite cost effectively. So that's how we approach that. Thanks. Hannah, farmer in South Yorkshire. George, could you tell us a bit more about the wild seam you're creating? It sounds very interesting. What trees are you putting in and are you going to graze it independently or will it form part of your block with your uh, pasture? Yeah, so it's. Um, it, I'm genuinely exceptionally excited about it. I think it. it I think it makes the agroforestry pale, actually, as it happens in, in significance. But anyway, um, essentially, what we're doing. So, uh, it, I personally don't like the term rewilding, just because it it puts too many people's backs up. But essentially, it's a kind of version of that. Um, so essentially, so I've got some orchard planting happening in it, but all native orchards and traditional. So they're on. Um, we haven't decided if they're eight or ten meter grids yet, but that sort of spacing um, and then a lot of the hedges are just native hedges with a lot of native fruits within those hedges and I'm making sure that those hedges are not just like you know the dot 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 two abreast ones but we'll have some like that and then we'll have some which are a lot denser and kind of sweep out basically it's very expensive not to do straight fencing I mean fencing is expensive enough anyway so I'd rather do a straight fence and make the curve a more natural curve um, with with hedging um, but in terms of grazing um, essentially, the, the whole idea of this wild seam, so that's like, there's that initial active planting, but um, a lot of what I'm trying to do is make sure that I've got additional seeds on my farm um, that have places that can be deposited by mammals or by birds and then have the ability to grow, um, which obviously if you're conventionally farming and, and if, if you're mowing the edges of your fields each year and cultivating and doing all those things, you don't often leave space for those seeds to actually grow. And so also in line with enabling those seeds to grow, we're sort of, at the moment, we're grazing lightly once every six months. I want to get to a stage where we'll either do every nine months or maybe every 15 months to do a different season each year. But you want that long period of regeneration without the livestock in it. So that's a sort of rough, rough plan at the moment anyway. George, you've told us about how you ended up uh, planting your big agroforestry project in what was unsuitable soil conditions. Uh, of course, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, do you think, having been through that and trying to advise uh, new, new planters, um, could you have delayed the delivery of those trees or were you always fearful that you, your soil wouldn't have dried out by the time those trees started leafing up in the spring? So, uh, unfortunately, I had no choice when the trees came. <laughs> uh, nor did I have any choice to split my orders. So they came when they came and I had to deal with it. Um, I don't believe that is how they're being done anymore and I'm just trying to make sure I very much emphasise the point to people that do not do it like that because it's a good way of uh, not being a, a very enjoyable process. Um, but I mean, I would say um, I am amazed by the survival and I do also personally count survival if they're growing up from the rootstock, which I've probably got... 3% have died on top and are regrowing from the rootstock. Personally, I don't care. They're all fruiting rootstocks. Like, if it's something different, it still fulfills a, 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 good, a good niche for me within that, within that system. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, if I had the opportunity at the time, so the, so the biggest problem for me was they all, not only did they all come at once, they didn't, they actually came, they were meant to all come on the same day. They actually ended up coming over four days in weird splits 
and I had a planting team all lined up. So actually what ended up happening was rather than planting, you know, belt number one, belt number two, belt number three, we did half of belt number one, <laughs> some of belt number four, then, oh, some other trees are telling, oh, we're doing it. It was very difficult to organize on the day. But it looks terrific now. Hi, it's for George again. I was, you showed the species list that you had when you were planting your first agroforestry. Then you said that you would probably change that mix in the future or learn from your lessons. So I just thought you could t tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so to be honest, it's... it's um, so obviously 36-metre rallies and 6-metre belts is obviously like a very plain and simple... How do you, how do you design agroforestry for an arable farming system with sprays? is what that was. Um, I'm now organic and livestock, so I don't need that. I would, I think I'm focusing slightly more so that, again, what I'm trying to force myself to do is only do one field at a time. So I'm gonna do the one next to it. And my next one is slightly more focused on creating something more akin to a shelter belt. So a little bit based around um, having a certain dense area with hedge, which also then will encompass a fence. Um, but also then have some lighter woodland planting from that and then edging it with some fruit trees. And essentially what I'm trying to do is um, flip the... Essentially, I would rather have wider belts. I think you get a lot more benefit from wider belts, especially in a livestock system. Consequently, that will then lead to wider alleys. Now, in an arable system, you might say that's worth, worse for biodiversity, but actually, if you've got that in permanent grassland, your biodiversity is not that much worse by not having trees so regularly. So that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm, I'm working on at the moment. It's being planned for planting next year, so 18 months' time, or 16 months' time. Hi. Uh, it's uh, Simon from the National Forest. Um, I just wondered if you've got any thoughts on, on deep ploughing. I, I know uh, it has been used in the past to bury a lot of um, aggressive weeds or, or grass hoard without using... Um, herbicides and it brings up the subsoil so it weakens that so you can do wildflower lays and, and so forth but obviously it disturbs the carbon is it a question of breaking eggs to, to make your omelette initially or is it I, I just wonder if you've got any thoughts of where that stands nowadays in the systems that you employ for establishing wildflowers and trees actually because it can the trees can still root into the richer soil underneath, but have the, the poor soil on top uh, for, for wildflower establishment. <laughs> uh, I mean, we've not ploughed on the farm for, for 10 years. As it happens, some of the offline land that I've now put out to a contract, so it's being CFA'd for me, um, that actually has been ploughed because I'm not a very good arable farmer, so that was full of ryegrass at that stage. Um, personally, I don't believe deep ploughing has much of a place I, I don't actually have a problem with ploughing to manage for weeds, but I would argue you want to plough within your topsoil. Personally, I can't see a reason for deep ploughing, but I hadn't heard of the example you've just given. Um, I, wouldn't, I, I, f I don't mind a level of destruction. We're all, you know, if you're farming, you're going to be doing destruction, whatever you, whatever you say. Where, you know, it's where you sit on that, on that scale of how destructive you want to be. Um, Personally, I couldn't see an outcome that would benefit or justify that level of deep planning, but that's a personal view. I mean, yeah, I would, I would tend to agree that, yeah, that there, there wouldn't be many of any circumstances you'd want, you'd want to do that um, in general. You know, if, you, if you're looking to kind of reduce the nutrient density of land for wildflowers, you might look at kind of a, you know, a cut and hay approach to get excess nutrients off and then maybe go in a, that sort of way. But so, yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of damage has been done ploughing land to put trees in and often it takes you know decades for the total carbon stock to to um net increase because it, for the first few years the, the growth of the tree is kind of making up for the carbon you lost from the soil it takes quite a long time for that process to be undone so sorry what about the soil itself would, would it not could they didn't take that ploughing would it not uh, increase the depth of um Organic carbon content, or if you applied those methodologies to that soil, put the trees aside. Would uh, that not be a? Well, it, 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 it kind you know it kind of would. You would obviously get high organic matter in the bottom. You bring some subsoil up, but you could achieve the same through rooting depth over time, um, without uh, you know. Kyle, do you want to talk briefly about some of the issues with ploughing in terms of microbiology and the kind of disruption, the negative disruptions of yeah. ploughing? Yeah. <clears throat> 
So when we're talking about organic matter and carbon, uh, one of the issues with tillage is that the structure is broken down. So basically we have what soil is, is rotten rock and dead things. So we have sand, silts, and clays that group together by the, by the, the biology of the soil uh, into mac microaggregates and then into macroaggregates, largely by the fungi of, of the soil. And so what we're finding out now is a, the majority of carbon sequestration is that that carbon is actually dead Micro, microbial cells hidden within that micro, that those macro aggregates, if that makes sense. So, you know, I said less than one percent of the surface area is active microbiology. The other ninety-nine percent is dormant and dead. And so, when the better it's hidden in those macro aggregates, the better it is sequestered and stayed and stays in that soil. When we till, we just we break those macro aggregates open expose them to the decomposers and the oxygen, and that carbon can oxidize up into the air as CO2. So when we expose um, our subsoil, what little um, organic matter is there is now very vulnerable to hungry mouths and oxygen. So um, yeah, we do advocate for building those macroaggregate structures through soils uh, and that rhizosphere, that the microbes can feed off of and exude, and the fungi can then attract those rock particles, microaggregates, into macroaggregates and hide organic matter better deeper down. And that's that's one thing that trees do really, really well in perennial crops in general. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, Sam Riley from the Forestry Commission. A uh, question for the uh, gentleman with the lovely hat. Um, where have you been? That's where have you been sourcing your trees from? Uh, exactly. Just curious where you've been getting them from. Uh, so, um, various tree nurseries. I mean, my um, uh, original ones, certain ones came from um, uh, yeah, and, uh, Adam's Apples, Frank Matthews. Uh, I can't remember where the uh, like timber species came from. Um, ash something. Ashwood? Something like that. Um, nurseries. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, on the whole, I mean, certainly for new, so uh, the few kilometres of hedging I've got going in this winter are being sourced by a contractor I'm using, who's very experienced. He's actually moved on to using plugs rather than bare roots. Um, so it'll be intriguing to see how well, how, how well they take. Anybody else? Um, George, I'm just wondering, with the um, caterpillar outbreak on your damsons, did you plant all your fruits in kind of blocks, or were they mixed up? Um, yeah, this was, it was actually quite a, a, a quandary for me and ultimately I did have to actually change some of my planting and what I was designing um, because of this, how sporadically the trees were coming, um, which is very frustrating. Also, because you can't leave like, your auger holes open, for instance, so you have to plant something in them. So originally my intention, and again, uh, uh, Helen said yesterday on the farm walk, um, I can't remember quite what she quoted, but I basically plant plant slower and do it better. Um, I obviously didn't have the choice because of just how circumstances unfolded. Um, but yes, all of mine are together, but they are obviously um, perpendicular to the prevailing wind. So in theory, you haven't got disease travel across because every variety is different across the field in, in the belts and in the trees next to, but they, they will be in blocks up the field. Um, some of that was to do with harvestability as well. Um, but I do think there's probably a sweet spot of maybe, let's say you had three varieties um, in one row, uh, you could do sort of ABC, ABC. In terms of harvestability, I don't genuinely think that slows you down very much, but I do think you'd have a lot better kind of resilience in a system design designed that way. Um, so I'd definitely be aiming to do something along those lines in the future. Thanks. Brilliant. Oh, well, thanks once again um, all for coming and sitting in this very hot tent for so long. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll just uh, give another big round of applause to our speakers, George and Kyle. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org 
forest slash agroforestry.